All right, everyone. Let's continue with our luncheon keynote. So, um, our key luncheon keynote will be given by uh, Professor Dan Siciliano, here from the law school. Uh, Dan is um, the uh, faculty. Uh, faculty director of the, uh, the Rock Center for Corporate Governance. Um, he's also uh, associate dean for uh, executive education here at Stanford. Um, so uh, his keynote will be focusing on you know, why lawyers will be faster, smart, uh, smarter, richer, and a lot fewer in the future. So great, thanks. So I, I never know how to take it when you get asked to do a lunch keynote. It's like, okay, maybe I'm hyperkinetic, so I can keep you from falling asleep. Uh, maybe I, I you know, it, it won't matter. But uh, so I'm going to try to go. We've been given permission to go to 1:10, but I want to finish by one and do some Q&A. So I'm going to try to keep this relatively short. So I was just trying to grab attention with the title, really, right? So why lawyers will be faster, smarter, richer, and a lot fewer in the near, near future. Um, first, let me, I, I always get introduced as a professor here at the law school. I teach finance, I teach venture capital. I do a lot of work in the corporate governance space, running our Rock Center for Corporate Governance. Uh, but uh, there is a secret life uh, that I had before I became, and it, to a certain extent, while I was a law professor, uh, in 2001, I co-founded with another guy, a Canadian, as it happens, a company called Law Logics Group Inc. Uh, I had been a teenage hacker, but like my real coding skills were in Fortran 77, and my COBOL was kick-ass. So um, that didn't serve me real well, but uh, I found a really great uh, renegade senior architect engineer uh, who really didn't know that you couldn't do certain things, which really served us well. We designed a series of products for lawyers. Back in 2001, when it was you know, cloud-ish, but we called it ASP, Application Service Providers, uh, we never took venture money. We took uh, Angel and whatnot and, and bought those guys out. We grew LawLogix till it was actually pretty big. Uh, we had more than 1,000 law firm clients throughout the country and the world, uh, more than 2,000 large enterprise clients for our compliance product. Um, and we're very proud. We won the Inc. 500, 5,000, uh, seven times in a row. We might get it an eighth time. Kind of hard to keep doing that year on year. And finally, we actually got bought by PNC uh, in December of 2012. I am, though, as disclaimer, still very involved in the company. I'm executive chair. I'm not sure what that means, other than I'm not actually in charge. Um, so here's what the talk's about. Smart humans and lawyers, one and the same, very often, are confident. In fact, we have a lot of data and understanding that lawyers are overconfident, and it manifests in a lot of ways. A lot of times, overconfidence is great. Uh, I normally give a little quiz where we kind of test our own overconfidence. It's kind of fun. But in the interest of time, I'll point it out to you if you want to do it online uh, when we're done today, but we don't have time to cover it. But let me tell you why we're overconfident and some other kind of neurobiological factors that impact the way lawyers end up behaving, for example, and lots of professionals. So first, our brains want to make us happy, want to be efficient, want to use as little energy as possible, but still allow us to survive. Uh, this is great. It, it does a lot of good things. It's cognitively efficient, uh, and it's a fantastic strategy, except it works best in a very linear world. And by and large, for humans, for millennia, the world has been pretty linear, except now we have some manifestations of what we'll call geometric progressions that impact our real life. So if this is true, if something is changing that impacts you fairly directly, and it's changing very quickly, um, it makes a lot of the heuristics we borrow from our kind of efficient slash lazy brain a little dangerous in terms of decision making. Um, in turn, the interconnectedness that occurs uh, in that situation can kind of double down the problems because you have some technologies, for example, impacting things so greatly that the entire framing is changing and it makes it hard to make the right decisions. Uh, technology technically is simply a very special exaggerated case of this underlying geometric progression issue. Um, the rates of change in technology at both the theoretical and applied level are changing uh, and accelerating. Uh, there is what we call induced correlation because technology itself disrupts markets, for example, and those markets then emerge bigger and they might eliminate another market. And so you have this causal feedback loop that's due to the rate of change. And then finally, entire problems or issues, often in a very good way, so long as you're not the disruptee, uh, are refa reframed and transformed. Here's the problem for lawyers. The lawyers in most of this story are not the disruptors, they're the disruptees. Um, and some of them will probably be the disruptors. Not by design or fundamental insight or cleverness, 
but by the fact that they're highly flexible and they're gonna work really hard to survive and thrive, and in so doing, they will latch on to some of these technologies and end up being the disruptors where everyone else ends up being the disruptee. So first, let's talk a little bit about um, this compounding phenomena, the fact that we tend to think linearly and we're not so good at. So I teach finance. In finance, I talk about compounding. We tend to underestimate the effects of compounding. Benjamin Franklin has my favorite uh, saying about compounding in the finance context. He says, money makes money, and the money that money makes makes more money. So what that means is if you put $100 in the bank and uh, you get 10% interest, don't trust that bank is a side note, right? No 10% interest in the bank these days. So you get 10% interest, then at the end of the year you have $110. If you let it ride for another year, you end up earning $11 of interest. Why? Well, you got your $10 from your original 100, then you got an extra buck because you had the first $10 in there of your original year's interest. Okay, this seems pretty straightforward, but here's where humans trip up. We tend to, and this technically, by the way, is called the future value of an investment. Okay. So this formula can be applied not just to finance, but to rates of change, technological power. We all know the power curve for computational, you know, Moore's law analysis, right? About every 18 months, we end up with transistor size shrinking, which causes doubling of the production and effective power of chips, et cetera. So that same idea is just a progression that has a geometric feature because that N is an exponent. So here's the first example of where we trip up. Now that I've set you up, you're gonna say, wait, wait, this is totally a trick question, but it's true, but we'll go through the exercise anyway. Here's what I offer. I will give you either, let's pretend I'm like from the you know, National Science Foundation, big grants, lots of largesse, your tax money at work, and I'm carrying a suitcase or a briefcase of $10 million, cash, tax-free, laundry-free, et cetera. Totally legit. Or I say, I will pay you, no risk of default, it's gonna be put in escrow, you know, you're gonna get it, also tax-free, a penny doubled every month. So, which one do you take? Now, lawyers, law students, when I do this, they have a bunch of smart alecky answers, right? So, set aside the lawyer stuff, which is about default and risk and breach, and just take it at face value, right? $10 million or a penny doubled every month. How many people take the $10 million, for example? Anybody? I've got a few. Okay, how many people take the penny doubled every month? So I've set you up well, you've, you've said this is a trick question, I'm going to pick that double penny, that, that penny doubled. First, what's the most important, I, I can't resist it, what's the most important legal question before you accept this arrangement? So let's assume you're going to go for the, the penny doubling, what do you ask? Right, right, okay, so good, thinking like a lawyer, like who are you and uh, could I see some ID? Okay, let's assume we establish all of that and we're settled, what's the next most important legal question? Ah. Which month? Why? Well, because in February, you made the awful wrong choice. One point something million dollars. In a 30-day month, you also made the wrong choice. 5.35-ish million dollars. In a 31-day month, it's 10.7 million dollars. Right choice. So, the first legal question is, which month do I get to double my penny in? Right? Uh, second most important question? probably transferability. Come to a finance lecture, we'll talk about why that's super important, but um, let me highlight this kind of quintessential difference. So I'm showing you what is essentially a geometric progression where you are doubling something every day, right? And the problem is in your head, you double a penny and say one cent, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, dollar 28, 256, you're like five, okay, five bucks, whatever. All right, here you go a long ways. And you, it's hard for you to kind of visualize getting to the millions and then the, you know, the next part. So you now see this progression here, right, which is you know, pretty clear. It makes a lot of sense. You end up at the $10.73 million at 31 days. So here's to prove a point. How much, someone volunteer, and you know it's got to be a big number, someone volunteer how much you will pay me as that National Science Foundation guy to give you 30 more days of this game. How much do you pay me to to give you 30 more days of this game. Someone, there's no risk here, just pick a big number and tell me. 10 million, all right. Anyone else want to pay me more than, I say I'm going for the highest bidder, who the only one of you gets it, anyone else would pay, be willing to pay more than 10 million? Someone pay, anyone willing to pay a billion? Okay, well, and, and, and we know, so that's good. We've got sciencey people in the audience, it's good. Faster than the lawyers, I like that. So here's the thing you don't estimate, right? I'll give a prize to anyone who can actually 
name that number, right? So what you did not estimate, it would be, it would be a quintillion number, right? It's a huge number, much larger. And we do little tests and exams of people, often sitting directors of publicly traded companies, as it turns out, uh, to help them understand this stuff. Let me give you a different example real quick, and that is uh, any uh, space fans in the audience? We know that the Voyager crossed the heliopause last year, right? It took a little while. Uh, it was going at a not quite static speed of about 30,000 miles an hour, give or take. It actually had a little bit of accelerative float. So in this story, we pretend that in 1978, started out at 29,400 miles per hour-ish. You get a 1% rate of acceleration per year. That's technically not quite right, but it makes the math work nicely. And we don't cross the heliopause, this is the percentage of the way they've gone, until 2013. So here's the question. How much faster do I cross the heliopause if I accelerate at a rate of 30% instead of 1%? So it's a geometric progression question, but it's not as profound as the penny doubling thing, right? So in that case, we actually crossed the heliopause in 1987, about five weeks before the Challenger disaster, right? So 30% rate of acceleration on an annual basis really gets you a lot faster. But here's the funny, here's the more interesting question, which actually applies to technology as impacts lawyers. Lawyers are not typically quantitative folks. There are exceptions, but they tend not to be highly quantitative. That means they're really good at estimating, and they're really good at uh, intuiting a lot of different things, and they're really good with words. Some of them, again, there's exceptions to all this, but one of the things they tend not to do is they're overconfident in their estimations about how trends look out two years, five years, 10 years, and they kind of make the mistake that I'm about to highlight. So the question is, what percentage of the way does Voyager get across the universe by, say, 2142 if it's accelerating 30% per year? So we get to scroll way down that far right column. That's how far across the universe it gets. Uh, so we keep going and we keep going. Excel can't even fit the numbers after a little while. So we get to 2142 and yay, 0.0007. Okay, so the universe is really big, apparently. But here's the part that's hard. How much farther along do I go if I just change the acceleration rate from 30% to 40%. So I, I, how my, in, by the year 2142, how much, I was at 0.0007, right? So if I up it by a third, so it's 33% rate of acceleration faster, 30% to 40%, how much faster do I do? And you're like, oh no, Dan, you totally screwed up. It's like, doesn't even show up. Look at that, it's hardly there. But that's the misestimation. Oh, I actually did screw up, that's kind of funny. Uh, hang on, <laughs> let's try that again. Let's see what I did. Exactly. Oh, look at that. Well, that's very depressing. I somehow, hold on. I seem to have lost the compounding effect. All right, so we have to, you have to bear with me for about 30 seconds here. And I'm going to see what happens down here. Ah, I overwhelmed it. Well, it's not going to be as dramatic. I want to take the time to fix it. I'll tell you what the answer is. The answer is at 2142, we're 100% across the universe. Right? So that small difference compounded across enough, enough periods actually brings you in 2042, not to 0 .007, which is now a fixed number, but basically to 100%. There is a small physics problem, which is you're going about 17,000 times the speed of light at that point, but set that aside for a moment. <laughs> but here's the point, which is almost every lawyer, in fact, almost any professional who isn't like a full-blown hardened mathematics scientist, when you present this problem and you make them bet money about their answer, and they say, what percentage are you by that same year? No one gets close, not even anywhere close. And so here's the thing that's funny. Some of the technologies that impact law practices, consumption of information, natural language translation, reframing so that average people aren't professionally trained can understand it, some of that stuff is changing at an accelerated rate of two, three, five, ten percent 10% per month. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that the underlying computational power matters a lot. That's accelerating, but not quite that fast. But what is happening is the ability to generate apps, the ability to generate efficient databases, the ability to mine big data is actually very rapidly accelerating. So this story, if you turn this into months and not years, is kind of the same underlying story. It surprises lawyers. So let me show you what happens to lawyers and why and take it from a little bit of a kind of empirical basis. I'm going to skip, uh, so that was our you know, non-finance example. Voyager travels across the heliopause. 
a quick note about photo taking, just to make a key point. Everyone knows the story. Photos were super expensive. They're expensive to produce. That's obvious. They became less expensive to produce when we switched to digital. They became a lot less expensive to procure and take and utilize when the convenience factor escalated. When did that happen? It happened when people could carry their camera with them everywhere, kind of accidentally, because it was embedded in something else. And then over time, you end up with this fantastic rate of adoption. Why? Because it became almost costless to use, not just produce. I'll come back to that point, which is happening in law. It's not the cost of production that makes all the difference. That's super important. Cost of production of marginal cost of a photo dropped to almost zero. We know that. But the cost of use, the opportunity cost of use, how many minutes did it take you? How many seconds did it take you? How hard was it to share? How easy was it to disseminate? That transformed over the last 10 years. And that was the tipping point, right? So every day we produce more photos in the world than there were photos up until 1998, right? Every year. Why? Because it's so easy to do. So it was the use function cost that caused the transformational change. I'll come back to that. And it asks the question, which is the looming question to a certain extent for all technologies, but for law, what happens when the marginal cost of production and use for practical purposes drops to zero? And the answer is crazy stuff, like <laughs> crazy stuff. OK, so, so why did or do lawyers get faster? I'm going to take an example from immigration, because that's the area that I know best. Um, and there are a couple reasons why it happened first, I'm going to suggest. Uh, along with a couple others in immigration. One, immigration uh, is different, a little bit, and special because it has very high complexity but low variability. What I mean by that, for example, is it is a mess. There's a thousand different variables. They all go in different places. But the reality is that it's federal, not state. There aren't 50 or 51 or 52 versions of it. And though it is highly complex, it doesn't deviate much. right? It is a long and torturous and up and down path, but it's the same dang one every time. Right, so long as you pick the path right at the beginning. Then there are multiple iterative parties. The communications challenges were extraordinary. You have lawyers, we have what we call beneficiaries, the immigrant. You have petitioners, maybe the US citizen spouse, Intel, the employer. So petitioners can take lots of forms. You have the government, not just one agency, there are six agencies implicated in immigration law, ah, right? And then lots of others, including experts and other certifiers in that process. Distance and language for immigration lawyers mattered more than most. Federal, you can, yeah, there's some issues here, but you can be licensed in Florida and practice in California, right? Because it's all federal law, and your clients, at least in part, are very far away. So you needed to overcome that. And then there are lots of boutique firms, lots of little small firms. And we have this measure of uh, law firm entrepreneurialness. It kind of hovers around like 0.6%, which is to say you ask people a series of questions about risk taking, investing, and choices, and the answers come back from the partners. You're like, wow. You're a really good lawyer, but you are not entrepreneurial. When in these boutique firms, it was a much higher rate. Like one out of 10 would give you answers that mapped to truly entrepreneurial people who are willing to invest, fail, reinvest, et cetera. And then a fixed fee structure. This is important. They charge flat fees. You do an H-1B, it's a flat fee. Do a petition to adjust your new spouse from outside the country, it's a flat fee. Why does this matter? Because they don't have the billable hour conundrum. If I show up and sell them software and say, I double your productivity, if they charge by the hour, they say, leave my office, please, <laughs> right? Right now. Better yet, fall in that hole in front of my office and don't ever come back. If, on the other hand, they charge flat fees, if they say, really? And how can I get you not to sell this to my competitors, right? So they get the benefits of their efficiencies in a flat fee environment. And then there's the other reality, which we'll call exception lawyering, which is important in the following way, and that is, it's a hard truth, but I still think it creates wonderful opportunities for great lawyers, and that is that immigration is 90% detailed, excruciating, complex process, but it's not that hard. You just have to do it right. If you don't do it right, it's like the operator game where you gotta pull the little things out of it. Yeah, like there's no, that's not hard so much, you just gotta be good at it in a consistent sort of way. Same hole, same piece, same tweezers. Then, a little bit of the time, and certainly at the beginning of each case, maybe in the middle, maybe at the end, there's what we might call exception lawyering, which is in immigration, there's some weird, weird rules. So if you are the son, daughter, grandson, or granddaughter of someone who worked on the Panama Canal, there's about 27 pages of complex treaty-driven statute, which will grant you US citizenship if you aren't that. You could think you could formularize that at a certain level, maybe we can get there, but great lawyering spots someone who's in deportation and says, 
So tell me where you're from. Oh, I'm from such and such. They realize that the boundaries of that country changed and they were actually Panama 70 years ago. And they say, where was your grandfather from? And they say, Panama. Where did they work? Panama Canal. Ding, ding, ding. Right? Client wins. So there is exception lawyering, but it is really hard. It requires judgment. And one of the things that happens where there, there will be humans, I think, no matter, you know, for a long time anyway, immigration clients, not for nasty or terrible or evil and nefarious reasons, but immigration clients generally lie to their lawyers. There's lots of complicated reasons for this, but at some phase, the input that you get from them is not the truth, and it is a very important lawyering skill to extract the truth and then to deal with it. And great lawyers, that kind of 3% lawyering, do that exceptionally well. So immigration law was really set up beautifully to have this, and I'll mention something about this exception lawyering. If you read a couple weeks ago, uh, Bloomberg, former Mayor Bloomberg, uh, one of his private philanthropic efforts came to light about Tanzania, where he's fostering a big proje a project to train people who are high school graduates to do appendectomies and cesarean sections, because in Tanzania, lots of people die because they can't get an appendectomy, and they can't get a cesarean section, and it, the numbers are eerily similar. If you are taught how to do this really, really well, and I'm not advocating an authorized practice of law here, by the way, but I'm just analogizing. If you're taught how to do this really, really well, it's a very straightforward procedure in both of those cases. The problem in that story, of course, is that if anything goes wrong, if there's an exception moment, the person's dead. But as he put it, well, they're dead anyway, so we're better off, right? But what's interesting in our story is that in immigration, you have the ability to do something with that 97% and then have the lawyers focus on the 3%. You'll see a lot of law firms that don't do that. So here's how the faster kind of progressed. Phase one was in the 1980s. Boutique firms staffed up with more paralegals, more staff, more organization. Uh, they achieved what people thought of as kind of the immigration uh, golden ratio, which was 10 non-lawyers to every one lawyer. My first job, I worked uh, as an immigration lawyer, and I supervised 17 paralegals who basically did H-1Bs all day long. I lasted... 12 months, I was mind-numbingly horrifying, right? But it had this extraordinary ratio. These larger critiques achieve a, a genuine scale and process to get it done. That was the 80s. In the 90s, more paralegal still, a little bit more attention to formalized document production, and then the use of computers for forms, which at the time felt very impactful. It was the consistency, it looked good, you could screen for errors better, it was better than typewriters or handwriting. Then in the 2000s, phase three was truly case management. First time you actually had workflow case management of a genuine sort. You had predefined cases that would queue up exactly what you needed. You had true workflow, meaning it's like you do this next, you do that next, skip this step because you filled out that. And you had intake automation spelled correctly, preferably, sorry. Uh, intake automation, <laughs> intake automation was the queuing up of one of the 1,700 different questions you could ask your client in a way that was already pre-configured based on the case. And then, to add some real juice to it, available in 12 languages, right? Turns out that when you write down your address, if you ask someone their native language, the answer is going to be the same no matter what. It's just a foreign language address, right? So turns out in immigration, you could ask things in the native language, and you were getting exactly what you needed back as an answer. It was kind of fun. So um, you do all these things, plus you had electronic filing, uh, what was uh, called last step to paper, which is no paper until the very, very end, uh, and then technological integration with billing systems and other things. This happened in the 2000s, and you saw this big step. My main point is going to be it's very hard to tell phase two adopters from phase three adopters, unless you know their staffing structure, but it makes all the difference not in outcome or quality yet, but in firm profitability. So what happened at, at phase three adoption, those who went down the path of phase three aggressively, their profitability was decoupled from their effectiveness. So up until that time, immigration lawyers, there were great ones, there were good ones, and there was a lot of others where maybe you just didn't know. But you looked at the great ones, and you could kind of know how much they made, how hard they worked, and what their firm profitability was. This coupling went away in about 2008. So here's what smarter started to look like beyond the faster. So you end up with uh, dynamic data gathering and matching. So it matches data from other places. The Department of State has this thing called this, you know, the bulletin, which tells you where you are on the line if you have a, have a you know, waiting for a visa. Um, and it changes. It's a very strange thing if you've not practiced it. It goes forward and backwards, but they tell you a month in advance before it goes backwards, so you can try to file before it goes backwards. Only the federal government could come up with this, right? So that tracking is one of the great places for malpractice. Like, you don't notice that it retrogressed, is what we call it, and you don't file before the month turns over. 
that's, you know, there are a few places where it's like ah, malpractice. That's malpractice, right? So dynamic priority date engines came into vogue. Conditional reminders that said if the person hasn't sent you an email by this date, send them another. So pretty low hanging fruit from a technology viewpoint. And then predictive completion, meaning you can tell when they're gonna finish the intake stuff because they log in every day for like eight minutes only. Uh, and so you'll know when they're gonna be done. And then finally, paralegal productivity transparency. Turns out, really productive paralegals are 20 times more productive than unproductive paralegals, but it was hard to tell until you could track their keystrokes. So then we ended up with AAI, kind of artificial, artificial intelligence, which was these fancy algorithms. It's not machine learning, but it's just really fancy algorithms that spot red flags and the patterns of data. It's unlikely that someone from a certain region marry someone else in the 80s from a very far off region, for example. Uh, we know that, State Department publishes bulletins, bulletins about that, you can you know, grab it. Conditional branching, meaning the intake itself is dynamic. If you say, yes, I have a criminal history, well, you know, then it asks you about the criminal history. If you say no, you don't have to page through the criminal history. And then finally, the reality and practice. Here's why these law firms got a lot smarter. The lawyers in the law firms, they just focused more on the 3%. Lawyers stopped filling out forms. They stopped asking clients for the fourth time when they were born. They stopped actually you know, preparing FedEx packages. They stopped calling people up to make sure, in fact, that they'd sent them the birth certificate. They stopped losing files. All that stuff went away, and then they focused on being better lawyers, and their outcomes got a little better. And so, the next big thing in SMART for this area is gonna be natural language document consumption and sorting. The uh, holy grail for immigration case management is clients come in with what we call the folder and sometimes the wallet, and the folder has all these papers. They're like, blah, right? It's like hundreds of papers. It's got birth it's got marriage certificates, you name it. It's got photos, they don't know what they need, it's everything. And then they have also guys, especially guys from Latin America, have what's called the wallet. They pull out a wallet that's bigger than my briefcase, and then they open it, and it also has documents, right? And so the holy grail is stack it all up, scan it in, have the system parse it, do some OCR, do what it can, put it into pre-configured, has anyone seen, uh, I forget, Robin Williams, that weird film he did where it's called The Final Cut, where they had this, you know, people would die with the recording of their life and it came up on a screen and it would sort that person's life out and you make a little movie at the end for your funeral. I don't know, if anyone, no one saw that? Am I the only one? Okay, we got a few. So that's the, that's the holy grail for lawyers because here's where the smarter really kicks in. You stop having to look for the critical information and you can review the wide range of intake information much more than you can now to spot the weird stuff and fix it. So the get richer part, and I'll switch to questions. So client outcomes right now for phase two and phase three of faster are roughly the same. So smart, diligent lawyers at top firms, they produce really good output in immigration. Like they're among the best lawyers. They're, there's actually a cadre. A lot of them started out as civil, right, law, civil rights lawyers. They were litigators. They went into immigration for a variety of reasons. They're really good at their job. You can't tell from the outside if you don't know their staffing structure whether they are phase two adopters. There are very few people stuck in phase one. Phase two only, which is they scaled up and they have some computers that they do forms on, or if they're phase three. Hard to tell. But from the LawLogic system, you know, with millions of cases, millions of foreign nationals, and tens of thousands of lawyers over, you know, 14 years, we know that user productivity ranges from about, at, at two standard deviations, from about 0.8 to 17 cases per month of like cases, so similar cases. We know the depth of adoption of the system features, you know, there's 117 real deep features. Some people adopt 10, they're, much, they're not much more than forms users. Some people adopt 100, right? The depth correlates directly with the productivity on the per user basis, and it is causal. Um, and then finally, the higher performing employment and immigration lawyers, they differ right now very little on customer satisfaction, but they can have a magnitude difference in profitability. And to give you an example, a top immigration and labor employment lawyer at the top, um, of their game, one firm will have three associates, three partners, three associates, 25, 30 paralegals. Another firm will have two partners, one associate, four paralegals. They will both do, let's call it, 5,000 H-1Bs a year for Fortune 100 companies. And they will both be much loved and admired by their clients, and they're really good at what they do. From the outside, they, they both speak on the same panels, they both give the same keynotes, they both get the same awards. They're doing very well. They're both, I think, generally professionally satisfied. That first firm with the scale structure, they're taking home 150,000 per year per partner, give or take. That other firm, 1.2 to 1.8 million. It's a complete difference. And that's interesting. Like differentials in income, that's always interesting. Like, you know, 
plastic surgery, car wrecks, we're always interested when people make more or less money. I mean, that, that is interesting, but that's actually not the most important part. The most important part is we're right at the elbow of that curve, right? We are in 2139, if I've gotten that, you know, heliopause thing to work well, where in 2139, there's like 0 0.0007 across the universe, and if you're going at 40% per year, you know, eight years later, you're all the way across the universe. We're right at the elbow of what we call the exponential curve in terms of the impact because the AAI stuff, the artificial artificial intelligence, is getting better. The moment we achieve the holy grail of the consumption of natural language documents for pre-sorting, you know, most paralegals and lots of lower-end associates become obsolete. It is one of the higher-end functions of a good associate is to page through in a multilingual capacity and say, okay, this one is fake and this is his brother's and this, you know, and, and it takes time. Um, as soon as you can solve that, a lot changes, and what's interesting is the advantages of that process to the end beneficiary, the client, skyrocket. So we're already heading towards lower cost of production for the legal product, but the cost of consumption remains the same. You have appointments, you have to fill in stuff, you have to do all this stuff. Suddenly, the cost of consumption for legal services bottoms out. But here's the problem. For the early adopters, it's going to be crazy expensive. Right? I mean, it, it, it's not going to be super cheap. It'll get cheap, probably in five or ten years. But in those five or ten years, the firms who are already ahead will reinvest those extra profits, and they will pull farther ahead. And then the outcomes will change. That's what hasn't changed yet. By and large, those two clients, they're equally satisfied. Right? But now, as clients demand more transparency, faster responsiveness, and other things start to happen, and then they're Senior manager or vice president says, I just spent four hours filling out this freaking thing online. It was ridiculous. As soon as that becomes a pain point, and one firm says, oh, no, no, it's like 20 minutes. You just got to go in and review what we already pre-populated for you. When that happens, the outcome satisfaction will radically alter. And the weaker firms will get bought, but not the whole firm, just the rainmaker and maybe the beloved you know, paralegal will get sucked away out of a team of 20 people and be put into the high-performance environment and then the profits will go up even more. There's social implications for this, which may or may not be good, but I mean, that is the direction. And then the firms will acquire others and shed staff, and then the clients will demand to spend less time consuming the legal product and want the same outcomes. So what's interesting for me is this has already been underway for a decade. We are two-thirds of the way through this story, at least in immigration. Um, and what's intriguing is there's a bunch of little companies. Some of you will know their names, but you won't know most of them. I would suspect that 95% of you had never heard of LawLogix, right? They were the largest vendor in this space, right? With the largest I9, electronic I9 vendor that has even bigger efficiency gains. It's little companies kind of like incrementally pushing the ball forward, like at 20% per year, no massive breakthrough, no Facebook moment, just kind of like shoving it forward year after year. If you do that for a decade and a half, it turns out you're kind of like the heliopause story. It's like, wow, look, we're going really fast. So let me stop there and answer a few questions uh, before we run out of time. And uh, so that's the conclusion. If you can survive the elbow of the curve, uh, don't despair. There is lots of room for great lawyers, but uh, there's going to be this huge divergence, at least in immigration. I can't speak to it all. I can certainly speak to immigration. Questions? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay, great. Whatever, whatever you want. Yes. So I think you can, I can give you the things to look for, and then you all will know the practice areas better than I will if it's your area or something you know. So first, I think high complexity, low variation. So federal areas of law that are highly administrative, so um, trust and estates, you know, personal, not corporate bankruptcy, so the usual suspects. Already you see a lot of hollowing out of that, where a lot of times you have very good lawyers who are interfacing with clients, but what they're doing is they're chucking a lot of the work behind them to some other party who's using some of these tools to be very efficient and then bringing them back. And that, at least for me, assuming they follow the rules and there's genuine supervision there, that's a wonderful thing. Like, I don't want to pay a lawyer for like doing rote stuff overnight. What I want to pay them for is to read the end product, think about how to advise me well, ask me some good questions that they wouldn't have thought of if they didn't take the extra 20 minutes and were just typing stuff up. I, I think that's a good story, but anything that is complex, because if it's not complex, by the way, it just gets displaced. Like it could go, it's not in the zone of law in the end. Um, but if it's complex, fairly low variance, and at first, I think it has to be practiced by flat, fleet, flat fee boutiques they'll adopt the technology faster. So they'll start the disruption, or people will go into that field realizing that they can be a disruptive firm, right? Other questions? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Julie Pearl uh, does a very similar thing, and not only did she start doing the visa things, but she actually created software yeah. that helps it pretty much become self-service. Um, and uh, she's amazing. I, we're going to have her speak at Legal Tech West Coast. So this is this is she's she's one of the firms that no one knows, like Law Logics. Uh, and interestingly, the insight there is by really understanding the practice area. So this particular person actually practices immigration law and has and runs an exceptional firm, a firm that you know mimics a lot of the stuff that I just described on the high efficiency side. And they designed their own software. And upon doing that, they said, you know, we should amortize the cost of our software. It's kind of expensive. Maybe we can sell it to some folks. And then they launched a software company. They're a vicious competitor, but they're good. They're good. Other questions? Yeah. So you can do what uh, SafeArth is doing, which is launch little software companies within your law firm uh, to do a software thing. The, the answer to that is develop the exception skills. So I think you have to identify and decide if your area of law is in fact impacted or maps to this idea of exceptional lawyering, which is to say there's a lot of routine stuff. It isn't that it doesn't require some smart people or smart systems or both. But the truth is the difference between doing it really well and exceptionally well makes no difference. If that's the story in that area of law, look for places where the difference between doing it really well and exceptionally well makes all the difference and refine those skills. So for immigration, it's about understanding the timing of large companies' needs around immigration. It's actually a, a management understanding issue and being good at telling when people are lying to you. Like those are two fundamental skills that no matter how good you are, if you lack those two, you'll never be at the you'll never be a great exceptional lawyer. So Identify your area of law, evaluate it for exceptional lawyering, build those skills. The good news is those are very human-centric skills. I mean, it's kind of like the bedside manner of law a lot of times, right? So I think it's, and to a certain extent, a positive story. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, lawyers are not generally good business people. They tend to be very good lawyers, and the best lawyers surround themselves with some good business people, so they hire a business manager if they're a boutique. If they're scat and arts, they build an entire organizational structure of a bunch of MBAs and figure out how not quite to share profits, but, you know, get really close. Um, you know, and, and, and so once you recognize that, then you get to this next stage where you're pleased that they have the insight about the potential of the impact of software, but then they develop these in-house software shops, which is a disaster. So... I, we know a lot about this from Law Logics just because the very best aspirational firm that had achieved a little bit of size in the 90s started writing their own stuff. And then they'd stop using it after a few years. They couldn't keep it up. They couldn't manage the security. Don't even talk about the security. Um, and all sorts of other issues. So my observation is that cloud is the best thing that ever happened to lawyers who haven't gone on the, down the wrong path yet. Meaning the cost of adoption and the upfront costs have gone way down. And so the choice between doing in-house and doing something that is, again, appropriately vetted, uh, you know, established, et cetera, cloud, means that it's easier to make the right choice. I hope, you might know better, but I hope, at least in immigration, people aren't making that mistake anymore. The offerings are just too good, and people are like, well, and we use the analogy, would you build your own car? You know, cars, once you got an assembly line, cars used to build, and they say, no, no, but we just have some really good car builders. I'm like, do you have a mechanic shop? Do you warehouse oil, do you have tires in house? I mean, you, have, you know, even once you can build it, the maintenance is there. Maybe time for more, yeah, I'm back. So I, I think ask that question in the next session as well, right? But I'll give you my very short answer. I think that uh, the majority are starting to see the light, right? And the question is, how flexible are they? Um, and that is yet to be seen. I think the very best schools with you know, very good reputations actually have a longer runway in which to see the light and make changes. And so they'll probably, in the, by the end of the story, do better. I think that part of the issue will be the disruption that occurs when, the law, or when law schools and this is my own bias, my personal, not, not speaking as associate dean, just speaking as me, 
Yeah. I think law schools need to come to terms with the idea that they are training people who may or may not practice as lawyers, and they should revel in that. They should say to themselves, I, I actually think law, great law schools should stand up proudly and say, look, we're a great law school, and we produce great lawyers, but you know what? If you want to spend very productive three years and learn things that will be extraordinarily useful over time and help you propel your career and not be a lawyer, this is a good place to go to as well, right? And, and they need to make that true. If they make that true, then I think things will go very well. I don't know, but the best guess is that a substantial portion, the lower quartile, you know, some, some chunk of schools just aren't going to be around for a while. Although there is a twist, right, which is we know a lot of private equity players are acquiring private law schools, right? And that's a little scary, feels a little weird, but I'm very curious to see what happens when someone gets bought, you know, they strip away your tenure, and then they give you a little bit of equity. I don't know. I mean, I, faculty may behave differently. I'll be very curious to see how that, how that experiment plays out, right? So no tenure, just equity. It's like a startup. I think it's good. Last question, I think. So. Yes? I noticed that people are like, you see trending on Twitter. Oh, my. OK. So I think it's harder to address that than it is to say um, the consumers of law are going to get the upper hand. So in-house and end consumers of law are going to be advantaged by this massively, right? So doctors have already gone through this disruption to a certain extent, right? WebMD means that when you go to your doctor, you've looked up stuff, you know about the drugs, you have questions, you have ideas about side effects. In fact, you, have a, they, you will raise things that they're like, yeah, hold on a second, right? And they got to look it up for you. It's not quite that easy for the end consumer of legal services to do that, but we're getting to that pretty fast. So I think, to answer your specific question, one possible outcome of that is that uh, the big law firms will be disrupted in part because the magic sauce of the kind of lack of transparency and the inability to understand what's really going on, that will evaporate as an advantage. I do think, though, that the very best big law firms for a long time are going to be places where large companies go when they bet the farm. Right? And, and I, I've watched Skadden, I've watched Wilson, I've watched others. It is a very interesting behavior when big companies will really, like Gap, like really aggressively control costs, play lawyers against each other, do fixed fees. They've gotten really fantastic. I saw the general counsel of these companies give a talk in front of um, you know, some law firms and other general counsels, and then a law partner came up and said, how much money? Do we have to pay you never to give that talk again? Right? He, 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 outlined, he outlined like the 17 strategies to reduce legal spend by 40% and get better lawyering. But at the very top, I think that companies will be risk averse and actually be willing to continue with the status quo. It's that next tier down. I think it's good for consumers, though. I think the end consumers of law get the upper hand, uh, as they should. I hate to say it, lawyers wear transactions costs. So you know, when transactions costs go down, Good things happen, right? Good things happen to society. So we're the disruptees. Oops, try to stay ahead of the curve, and uh, hopefully you'll survive. You'll be in that the right hand side, the really profitable. And by the way, I hope that people don't end up in law taking home, you know, just trying to take home the 1.5 to 2.5 million dollars. What I actually hope, and I'll fe finish with this, and it's a little bit utopian, optimistic here. What I actually hope happens is what's happened in some medical practices and primary care in Menlo Park and Palo Alto, and that is elite doctors have gotten together and formed practices where they decided that earning $200,000 a year was enough if they could just work two and a half days a week. And they actually formed these partnerships where the, the, the stable equilibrium was that everyone kind of agrees to work at what they love and what they're exceptionally good at, but to do it leveraged in a way that they actually have this remarkable work-life balance. Now, I think that'll be very hard to do, but there'll be room to do that. If you have a giant firm that becomes very small but makes all the same money, you have flexibility to re-engineer the way people work and how much they work. That's another talk for another day, but I'll stop there. Thank you very much.